My name is Jackie Chan with a Quote a film. Mr. Nice Guy. He is a nice person. He's a nice guy. He's Mr. Nice Guy, but he could smash your face. <laughs> Jackie Chan's appeal is his physical on screen ability, his childlike clowning, and uh, the man can sing. You know, he's God. Okay, forget the singing. Tonight it's fights, camera, slapstick, as we trace Mr. Jackie Chan's astonishing journey from pauper, almost sold off at birth, to biggest action star and highest paid Chinese actor on earth. But it's not all fisting or kicking. Martial arts means deep thinking. And here's the proof. My philosophy is just, I believe myself, what I'm doing to real life. I'm not to over, to boom, to punch the people and fly away. And I fight before, I fight somebody, I hurt myself. year old Jackie Chan has appeared in over 100 films and been the star in 62 of them. He's grossed a staggering £1 billion in worldwide box office and video rentals. And he's even got his own magazine. Jackie Chan is the biggest movie star in Asia. Also, he's the most popular movie actor in the world. If you think from audience figures, for instance, there are billions of people in China who flock to go and see this guy's films. Uh, one of his biggest movies so far was Rush Hour 2. You there, Jackie Chan! But Hollywood's success didn't come overnight. To crack America, a Cantonese-speaking actor first has to crack the language. If you say this person's the biggest star in Europe or in China, show me. But if someone comes over like Jackie, they're in a few films, and, hey, I, did you see that guy? I saw him in another film a year. Oh, I saw him a couple... Then they feel like... He's family. They own him. They've discovered him. They grow with him. I don't understand the words that are coming out of my mouth. Don't nobody understand the words that are coming out of your mouth, man. After years of full starts trying to break into America, it was the rush hour blockbusters that clinched Hollywood's success for Jackie. With a trademark blend of action and comedy and an inspired pairing of the Kung Fu King with Chris Tucker's wise-cracking cop. Watch out! Behind you. I knew Jackie Chan was, you know, a big action star. You know, he, he, he does stuff nobody else could do. So I wanted to mix that with my comedy. So I knew that was going to be a winning, you know, winning team with me and Jackie Chan. Is that my gun? It is my gun. Let's go. Your ass belonged to me. Why would they not want my help? Because they don't give a damn about you. They don't like you. I don't like you. I don't care. I'm here for the girl. The girl don't like you. Nobody likes you. Rush Hour 2 was incredibly important for him. You know, both the Rush Hour films were. That was one of the things which helped America work out how they could use him. And they realised that he was best um, as part of a duo, as a kind of buddy movie. Leo, you crazy, man. Look at us. We good as dead. Oh, stop your whining, Carter. What you gonna do if I don't stop, huh? I will slap the hell out of you right now, Lee. Yeah? Yeah. Bitch slap you back to Africa. Oh, you will? Yeah. Well, come on, let me see that. Well, no, I want to see you do that. It's taken them this long to realise that actually he's quite an accomplished uh, comedy actor and um, he's quite uh, adept at that sort of self-deprecating style of humour. Humility pays. The leading man who doesn't swear, booze or use evil guns is now box office superhero, stateside cultural icon and advertiser's dream.
he's instantly recognisable and represents uh, something very clean cut, uh, someone who's sort of made it on his own terms. Uh, so he has a very strong star persona. And alongside Michael Jordan, for example, Jackie appeals to the Asian constituency, whereas Michael Jordan yeah. appeals to the, the black American constituency. Um, they, they make a very powerful global marketing mix, if you like. I hereby proclaim this Jackie Chan Day in Hollywood. So, Asian demigod, Hollywood superstar, these days Jackie Chan's mixing it with everyone. Premier League action heroes, supermodels, and fellow free-kicking maestros. Crikey. But it wasn't always like this. In part two, we find out how the nicest hard man in the movies escaped poverty, then learned how to dance the kung fu. Jackie Chan's Hong Kong childhood started out pure Dickens on the Orient. His parents so poor, baby Kong Sung Chan was almost sold off to the doctor who delivered him for $20. Mercifully, Mr and Mrs Chan's luck changed and they found work at the US Embassy in Australia. They left seven-year-old Jackie behind in China and enrolled him in the Peking Opera School. Here he would be trained in all aspects of traditional Chinese opera performance. That's acting, singing, the martial arts, and applying lipstick. A friend of my father introduced that there's a martial arts school, like a opera martial arts school, like a boarding school. You can put your baby there, um, they can take care of you. Take care of your son. For a hyperactive kid, this old-fashioned school seems like paradise. <gasps> I just sit there, wow, I can kick everybody. Ooh, I, I, like, I can play, play the whole day. From morning until night, my father coming back, you like it? I said, yes. Then I signed a contract. Three years, five years, seven years, ten years. Then I said, no, I want ten years. Three years, too short. Ten years. But what had he let himself in for? We spoke to this man. With 20 years of martial arts under his black belt, he trained in San Francisco directly under Master Ginny Lau, Chan's schoolmate, for seven years. In those days, the training was very, very tough, very brutal. Uh, the, the old master there taught by the rod and used the rod to ensure that his students lived up to his expectations. The young Jackie's training regime at the opera school formed the basis for this movie dramatization, though the reality was somewhat harsher. If you think of a, a back bend where one reaches back to touch the floor and then stands up and goes to touch one's toes. The teacher would use a stick and swipe at their hands as they went back to make sure they came forwards fast enough. And as they bent forwards, a stick would come across the back of their heads so they would go down again fast enough. My teacher, Master Yu, I think it's about time you eat some noodles. I said, huh? What noodle? Come. Grab me. Pa, pa, pa. Wow! I'm crying like a hell, I want to run away, but where am I going? Nowhere to go. If they were naughty, then they would have to go into a handstand for the length of time that an incense stick would take to burn down. Flippin' heck. Not exactly Grange Hill, was it? Though by the time Jackie graduated, he could act and boast a diverse range of skills, from theatre and mime to martial arts and sword fighting. That's pretty tough training, so that all of them became very, very uh, highly skilled acrobats and athletes with tremendous flexibility, as they had to do. But uh, I think that, that that's certainly put Jackie in, in good stead for the rest of his life. Now, I really thank you. Without the punishment, how can I know so many things? As if he hadn't taken enough punishment at school, upon graduation, 17-year-old Chan duly embarked on a career in extreme violence and getting battered. He became a stuntman. Perfect timing. It was the start of the 70s and everybody was, well, you know the words.
Since the late 60s, Hong Kong filmmakers had been churning out kung fu movies based on ancient tales. This pulp cinema required a steady supply of stuntmen who not only knew how to take a fall, but also authentically replicate ancient martial arts and make strange grunting noises. The young, talented and somewhat over-enthusiastic Jackie Chan soon emerged as one of the best. He was the most famous Lung Fumo Seed, which means Tiger Dragon martial artist. That's their way of calling the stuntman. So if somebody said jump off that building and everybody else was like, oh no, it's too dangerous, he'd say, I'll do it. I'll do it. I don't care. I'll do it. He knew that he'd have to work incredibly hard to get into the, the film industry. I mean, I can see it as well. If, yeah. if I was in a position at his age and his, around surrounded by what he'd already known, um, I would be putting my hand up to absolutely everything that came along. It was a smart move. In a notoriously competitive industry, dominated by the legendary Bruce Lee, it was hard to stand out. I'm a poster. Second, Bruce Lee. Second, this big. Bruce Lee. Jackie Chan. When you see the poster, you just see, starring by Bruce Lee. Bruce was a unique presence, a genius martial artist who modernised the films with his raw energy, aggression and charisma. Jackie's stunt work first came to Lee's attention on the 1973 film Fist of Fury. One of his first notable stunts for me as a martial artist recognising him on film was taking the kick from Bruce Lee. Bruce Lee gave him a lot of respect for actually doing that stunt and, and, and taking a hard hit without any padding or anything else. I was in a few films in Hong Kong myself and uh, when you get kicked, believe me, Sometimes the punches do go through and the kicks uh, do go right through. Yes, Jackie, I forgive you. <laughs> Wanna hold this? I'd like your help. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Jackie Chan got his first break as an actor in a leading role in this intriguingly entitled B-movie, showing off to a girl. And yes, the dialogue is dubbed. <laughs> well, what do you think? <gasps> yeah, that's very cool. But unlike most of his fellow actors, the ambitious Chan was also quick to get behind the camera. I learned the stunt corner how to communicate with the director, how to cheat the angle, then slowly, slowly. And when 18 years old, I'm the youngest stunt coordinator in Hong Kong. Then events took a dramatic turn when the shocking sudden death of Bruce Lee created worldwide headlines. I saw Fist of Fury right. roughly about it was about August in 1973. And then about two, three days later, I picked up an evening standard and found out that he died. Bruce Lee's death, especially in the, the Western culture and our cinematic eye, is that he left a void, a gap. But not for long, the kung fu industry soon found a new Bruce Lee. Well, several of them actually. All called Bruce. Introducing a new star, Bruce Lai. Bruce Lee was a huge force in Hong Kong cinema, and he, you know, he was. There was quite a lot to live up to um, with Bruce Lee. Many people were pushed into trying to create the new Bruce Lee. There was a Bruce Lai, Bruce Lee, L I. Everybody like Bruce Lee and the old day. Bruce Lai, Bruce Table, Bruce Chair, Bruce Telephone. I mean, there was probably about eight or nine different Bruce Lee Lai Lee's characters um, that were floating around at the time. Imagining, of course, that then the public would go, well, this guy's Bruce La. How different can he be? As if we lived in a world where you would go, well, this guy's called Mint Eastwood. He's bound to be very like Clint Eastwood, I imagine. Mint Eastwood and Kurt Reynolds, how different can they be? All those actors uh, who, who sort of appeared in the post-Bruce Lee Kung Fu movies were sort of victims of the cycle in a way. They were, uh, they were bound to be failures in a sense because there, there would never be another, there could never be another Bruce Lee. Good job our hero was ignoring this attack of the clones, aiming instead for something a little more realistic. <gasps> Hong Kong producer Ung Si Yun had already sniffed potential pay dirt in Jackie's no-nonsense style when a script mixing comedy with martial arts landed on his desk called Snake in the Eagle's Shadow. It's a not the make revenge or a very bloody film. It's a comedy 
and the good story film. I, in this moment, I think this is for Jackie's movie. The, the really important thing about Snake and Eagle Shadow and, and Drunken Master is it didn't try and live up to Bruce Lee. It tried to take the Hong Kong martial arts movie in a different direction, um, incorporating clowning, as it were, kind of physical comedy into to the martial arts. And, and it just allowed Jackie Chan's personality to come through. Snake, okay, Snake, Eagle Shadow, okay. Then I do him, that's a snake mouth, boom. Okay, that's a snake tongue. Throw off the tongue. That's a snake tail. I look at the mirror. How can I make the prettier things prettier? Then the movie comes out, everybody, wow. Outstanding. Comedy. Genius. Jackie had only gone and blueprinted a magic formula for a completely new genre, the action kung fu slapstick comedy. Phew. Then we do the second one. It's called Drunken Master. Big success. We're all young people, not like an old director anymore. Let's not doing the Bruce Lee style film. We have to do our style. The director, Yun Wah Ping, Jackie already knew of him. He knew what uh, Jackie could do, stunts, martial arts, acting, comedy, acrobats. And uh, that script was just correct. Jackie could do everything. He wasn't the serious guy trying to be the new Bruce Lee. It was totally Jackie Chan and what Jackie Chan should have been right from the start. Comedy, action and kung fu. I don't remember any films with Bruce Lee where there was a scene where someone farts in a lift. This seems not, in the same way Steven Seagal has never sat on a whoopee cushion in any of his excellent films. And Jackie Chan decided to bring in this incredible uh, choreography of fight sequences with an addition of fart gags and uh, people getting on bicycles without seats and doing severe damage to themselves. When that was released in Hong Kong, I just went to number one. It was number one for 10 months in Korea. That film was massive. Everybody forgot about Bruce Lee. It's just Jackie Chan. This guy is a new claim prince of kung fu. The public went gaga for Chan's goofy chop socky take on kung fu. Both films became classics of the genre, and Chan was established as the record-breaking box office king of Asian cinema forever. Jackie's success means that wherever he goes, he will be literally mobbed. He's very recognisable. If he was to go out to try and find, just enjoy himself, he would have to wear a disguise, and it would have to be a good disguise. Unlike the one we see him wearing during this recent trip to a Hong Kong market. Look, it's rubbish. Jackie's early hits established him as a bigger box office star than Bruce Lee had ever been. But although he was knocking on America's door by the end of the 70s, his initial attempts to crack the stateside movie market ended in frustration. Fly there to see the director, not even five minutes, sit down. Oh, you Jackie Chan? Yes, my name is Jackie Chan, we're from Hong Kong. Oh, good, good, good. I think, yeah. We, we, we call you again. Thank you very much. Tomorrow at night, maybe tomorrow, 16 hours, back to Hong Kong. Nothing. I call again. Another idea. You go back again. <laughs> I go back. Hi, my name is Jackie Chan. I want to do this script. Okay, thank you. See you again. Boom. I fight back. Then later on, I waste my time. I'm not going to success in America. In his early attempts to become an international superstar, he wasn't ever so successful because the films uh, didn't really demonstrate the, the range of abilities in his performance that, uh, that he clearly has. I think he kind of assumed he would have that creativity behind the camera as well as in front of the camera, and he didn't. No producer, or at least the producer who worked with him on his first film, The Big Brawl, never watched any of his films earlier. 
didn't know who he was. So when Jackie uh, asked if he could go behind the camera and just check the camera angle, or um, we're we going to do this fight scene, oh, I have a good idea, I'm going to do a somersault and then do a kick over here. No, no, Jackie, just walk. Just walk and walk off, that's all we want you to do. Jackie must have found it extremely frustrating yeah, in his early you. years of, of Hollywood because uh, you can just imagine the scenario of, of this unexperienced, non-martial artist director trying to tell him what to do. Uh, and I don't think there was any, I don't think there was any dialogue. They was just going, you know, I want you, I want you to shoot it like this. I want you to bounce off of this wall and, and do, do some of your Hong Kong fooey stuff. And then, you know, uh, you know, and he must have just yeah. been so like, no, you know, you, know, you, <laughs> need, you, know, you need to, you, you don't understand, you need to do this. They didn't treat him like Jackie Chan, the star. I mean, he's God in Asia. And they didn't treat him well, and the movie didn't, didn't do well, so he had a very bad experience. So he had a difficult time having a career in the United States, which is, like I said, what he always dreamed of having. His US debut misfired, not surprisingly. The Hollywood directors underused Jackie's martial arts and comic potential, instead concentrating on polishing his English dialogue. Schoolboy error on their part. In a minute. Right now, my English is 10 times better than before but still no good. How can I, I'm like an ABC American born Chinese, like big bra. If the script doesn't fit, nobody concentrate my action. Nobody, nobody concentrate my, my dialogue. They only concentrate my, my English. Coming up in part three, we see how after a decade back on home ground, Jackie finally cracked America and the world. Helped by two pale faced superstars of the silent era. In the 80s, Jackie Chan's knockabout brand of kung fu was huge in Asia, but not exactly setting Hollywood alight. Yet those sporadic, ill-fated stateside trips did have an upside, exposing him to silent movie greats like Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton. Honest, when I'm making my movie, I never see Buster Keaton in Harold Lloyd. Some press from uh, outside. You know what? You look like a bust Keaton in Harold Lloyd. Who are they? I only know Charlie Chaplin. And the old day. Then they slowly sent me the, the video. Then I started looking. Wow. That's bust Keaton. Oh, the things he's doing, almost like me. But he must have recognized something of what he had begun to do and had started to work for him in the, the work of these you know, great Americans. And I'm sure somewhere in there, he realized that if he could tap into what worked for them, he, that would be a key to breaking the American market, which is something that he really wanted to do. Jackie Chan had to find another way of getting into the movies and not trying to emulate something that couldn't be emulated. And, and I think he'd done it perfectly in that he looked at his, you know, his heroes in the, the action sort of physical comedy like Keaton. He loves that slapstick and that cheeky grin and it just worked for him. All the comedy, humor, he, he never do a lot of, you know, funny face. He just do it by himself. The wind is not actually not that big. He just create all the wet floor. See, now he just do it by himself. Wet floor. And I've been learning these kind of things for him. And I use his idea and just create my own things together. Then we use again, reuse again, that's all. Then I get the idea from rhythm, timing, use a lot of props. Maybe the, the guy give me a punch, boom, I just put in here. Then, maybe, then you see the, the TV on, in, on. Off, on, on, off, on, off. Maybe put it here. Boom. Why is it? Good. You know, that become an action sequence with comedy. That whole idea of using what's ever to hand is kind of really inventive, fluid, and completely anarchic kind of choreography, dance choreography. <laughs> Oh, 
that the kind of skilled timing is extremely rare. He, today, there's very few people, um, especially actors, that can perform that kind of physical timing. It's, it's extremely hard to do. In Project A, Chan used these influences to break new ground for kung fu flicks with tightly choreographed martial arts, pratfalls and stunts, even recreating the famous clock tower scene from Harold Lloyd's silent classic, Safety Last. He takes stuff and he doesn't copy it exactly. He takes it and adds to it. I think that's an essential part of his uh, childlike playfulness, his, his innocent improvisation, is that he can pick a subject uh, that somebody has used already, utilise it with his own style and, and, and make it more impressive and specifically Jackie Chan. <laughs> Harold Lloyd doesn't actually fall, Jackie Chan does fall through about three canopies and there's one shot and you see him going down and you see him literally land on no mats or nothing. Yes, what you're seeing was done for real. Ouch! It's like a cartoon. It's really like that moment where you run off the cliff and then you kind of look and you go, oh, I'm on a cliff. But the difference is, of course, you bounce back and punch Roadrunner in the face. I actually thought he was going to die. I'll be honest with you, I thought he was going to die. I thought, my God, no, no man on this earth could, could hang on to that and, and jump down. To hang from a clock, 40 foot up, fall through two different tiers of, of uh, lean to, what do they call those? Things. Things, those lean to things covered in fabric. I can't remember what they're called. Mm. That really annoying. To, f to fall like that, 40 foot, go through, go through two of these screens and then hit the deck. And then get up, find you busted a bone and go back to the top to get another shot. You know, certifiable. And it's all real, you know. I mean, anyone who watches it may think it's fake, believe me. It was real. I was standing there watching it myself. Jackie is famous for, for even, even now, to some extent, doing all of his own stunts. And he, he, started, he started really as, a, as an action scene fight director. Um, that's really where he sort of made his name in, in, in the Hong Kong film industry, before he became a director and before he started to take control of uh, his own projects as a director, star and fight director. Um, so he's very much uh, someone who's very hands-on in the martial arts sequences. In the process of building up his skills as, uh, as a director and editor, actor and, and martial artist, he sort of encompassed the body of people he could trust around him to do the, the wire work safely and to, to perform the hits and kicks and contact points that it takes years of practice to make real. And I think that's why his, some, of, uh, some of his film work is so explosive because uh, he's, over the years he's done all his own stunts and put in the hard time uh, and, and he keeps it real all the way through. <laughs> Hollywood outsider maybe, but homegrown Hong Kong smashes like Police Story, Armour of God and Twin Dragons saw Chan's global cult status steadily grow, as well as his medical bills. He's dislocated his pelvis, he's broken his nose three times, um, numerous back and neck injuries, um, he dislocated his cheekbone, I didn't even know you could do that, it was, it's just ridiculous, anything that he could break he's broken. <laughs> The worst one was the um, Yugoslavia, Armour of God, in 1986, where he was uh, on a wall, jumping into a tree, and the branch snapped, and he fell and hit his head on a rock, and they had to... Um, it was a life-saving operation, and, and now he has a plastic plate um, on his head. So if you watch the Jackie Chan films, you'll always see that he protects the right-hand side of his, his head all the time. He won't ever let it be hit there. He always uses uh, a chandelier when the stairs will do. He doesn't always use a chandelier, that was just in police story, but that's the nice thing about Jackie Chan. Here's the easy option, here's the lift, and here's the enormous burning pole leading down to all the nails, knives, and 37 
fight hungry stooges. You know, it's a forty foot. Fairness. It's a forty foot jump, right? With a, with a, with a sort of five foot gap to get to the pole and forty foot down. You know, no, stuntmen today would be curious. You know, would want to be safe about doing that. They probably want to do that in two takes with crash mats down the bottom. Not Jackie. No, no, no. I want a light bulb between the crutch, and I want to land in some gas when I get to the bottom of the forty foot. Yeah, he did this for real. He damaged himself so badly doing this. He had third degree burns on his hands. He damaged two of his vertebrae. And I think he dislocated his hip. Dislocation, broken spine, hole in the head. Pa, mere trifles for our man Chan. Mind you, the backlog of Hong Kong insurance claim forms may well have been a key stumbling block to Hollywood success. No, really. The reason why he became so big in Hong Kong rather than America is in Hong Kong, it's a lot more easy to get insured. Um, and insurance can stop a film. Jackie has probably quite a gung-ho attitude towards uh, the stunts um, as being a very important integral part of the film, so he wouldn't have it any other way, insurance or no insurance, it seems to me. Yeah, and Jackie was wondering if it would be all right if he fell off a 100-foot wall into in some concrete. He said he's done it before, he's got a little trick he does, he learnt it at, at opera school, it's fine. The insurers kind of go, no. Whereas in Hong Kong, they go, yeah, that's right, that's fine. We've, we've got some bandages, probably, and some ointment. Eventually, by the mid-90s, lack of common sense prevailed. Chan's massive, consistent success in Hong Kong convinced US film company New Line to give him another shot, with New York-based Kung Fu caper Rumble in the Bronx. Jackie did have reservations about trying to conquer America again, but his decision to go west and make the movie proved a crucial turning point. Rumble in the Bronx was, for Jackie, the right vehicle to get into, to, to get the recognition he needed. It incorporated uh, the direction of Hollywood-style action hero cop adventure, which, which everybody could hear to, but it had Jackie's intervention of martial arts from the East, and, and the two married quite successfully. Yeah. The film opens to excellent reviews and topped the US box office charts the week it debuted. Now into his 40s, Jackie Chan had finally unlocked the gates to Hollywood and a global audience. He even became an unlikely Britpop icon. As soon as the song came out, yeah, a lot of people sort of coming out of woodwork. You know, we all of a sudden became honorary members of a Jackie Chan fan club, and we got we got sent, um, you know, signed photographs from Jackie Chan himself. And then, best of all, we got uh, offered to be in a soundtrack for Rumble in the Bronx. And because the song is such an homage to Jackie Chan, it, it obviously fitted perfectly. We turned up to a few shows. Turned up to a couple of shows and gave us t-shirts. We've always actually wanted to get Jackie Chan on stage with us at some festival. You know, yeah. we've, we've put in a few requests, but obviously he's been, he's been a bit too busy. But someday, yeah. someday we'll have him. Rumble in the Bronx grossed over $32 million in the States alone. Its impact was crucial and brought him to the attention not only of audiences and critics, but also new filmmakers. Directing Jackie is kind of like taking a math test with a calculator. Because, you know, any struggle that I had, you know, trying to decide where I should put the camera or how I should start the scene, he has the answer. So having him there was not only it's just a great honor to be his director, but I was also like his student at the same time. I mean, I don't think there's anybody in the world living who has as much knowledge and experience about filmmaking as him. Nevertheless, there were still occasional reminders why the American way frustrated him. A director of photography on Rush Hour proved a case in point. I remember the Rush Hour 1. It really makes me very, very mad. I'm very young in Hollywood, and the DP, his order by the company helping a new director, Brett Ratner. Everything, same angle, same lighting. I get angry because you don't know. I know you, you're the best DP, but action scene, you know nothing. 
You are 80 years old. If you're talking about the action scene, I'm 120 years old. Really, but what can, how can you say, I just, yes, okay. There's a certain amount of snobbery in Hollywood. They didn't want to admit that this guy was actually teaching them how to shoot martial arts films. The rush hour movies, and the fight scenes in particular, bear all the hallmarks of Jackie's years of training and his computer-like brain. One day, I remember, in the pool table scene, I shoot number one, number 20, number 80. What's between two, three, four, five, six? You don't know. Right? I said, boom, 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 boom. Now turn around. You go away. He don't know what's the camera angle anymore. He pick up the lens, he go away. I'm so happy. I want the proof. When the action scene coming, I better than you. I can't conceive how he choreographs those stunt routines. It's like some kind of mathematical formula. You can see, for example, that uh, from here I've got to run and jump and land on here, and I'm going to have to roll and tumble to, f to take the ener energy out of that. So all the skills that he learned in Peking Opera School will enable him to then roll a f uh, some footage through his own mind before it's happened. <laughs> So, 18 years on from his first attempts, Hong Kong's most bonkers stuntman had finally cracked Hollywood, and he hadn't even changed his name to Bruce Chan. Coming up in part four, we see his most explosive work to date, and a Western dream finally fulfilled. After Rush Hour's success, I have an idea. Yes, let's do Shanghai Noon. I want to be a cowboy. Now that Jackie Chan had finally secured his place alongside the Hollywood greats, he wasn't in the mood to let things slip. So what next? A romantic lead opposite Gwyneth Paltrow? No, a Chinaman on the loose in the wild, wild west. I have so many dreams. I want to be a cowboy. I want to be a fireman. I want to be a superman. I want to be an army. But I know I don't have a chance. So suddenly, when I become a director, a writer, I write my own script. I write police story. I, I write a CIA, I write so many things. Then, after Rush Hour success, I have an idea. Yes, let's do Shanghai Noon. I want to be a cowboy. In Shanghai Noon and its cleverly spelled sequel, Shanghai Nights, Jackie brought a little bit of Hong Kong fooey to Hollywood. The man who can't get life insurance started showing off with new, more elaborate stunts and also revisited some of the old ones with his grand finale hanging off the face of Big Ben. Look familiar? Shanghai Nights was Jackie's favourite Hollywood film and not just because it was one of his most successful. And I asked why and he said, if I wanted an extra two days to do a fight scene, I had it. If I wanted to go beyond a camera, and totally changed the angle, I had it. Everything I wanted to do for a fight scene or an action scene or a stunt scene, I never heard no. Grossing $60 million at the US box office, Shanghai Nights proved that American audiences really did have an appetite for Hong Kong-style fight choreography. Now, come on, move it, lad. Come on, move it. It also gave a Chinese cowboy the chance to teach a Charlie's Angel how to kick like a kung fu master. You gotta really respect what they do. I mean, this is what they do, this is what the movie's about. I go out there and I think I know something and I suddenly feel like an idiot, you know? <laughs> oh. 
It comes to life when, when the fight sequences start. He involves the entire set, the props, all the other actors. It's a very sort of uh, full-on choreographed, almost like a musical number. There's a certain kind of dance that Gene Kelly perfected where he would use items around him in his choreography. It's called bricolage, singing in the rain with the umbrella, that kind of that whole routine is a classic example. So you know, this is exactly what Jackie does. It does seem almost as kind of physical and, and sort of elegant, the movements, as, as it is in any of the kind of 1950s dance movies. I sing the ring, I sing the ring, boom, boom, da, 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 after a lifetime in film and having raised more laughs than most Hollywood comedians, it turns out that Jackie has one ambition left. He wants to be taken seriously. Actually, I want to be an actor. Some really, I uh, hope really one day, without all the action, without all the comedy, just like Duxing Hoffman, Robert De Niro, yes, acting. Then, does the audience still like it? Yes. Ah! Whether or not he makes the leap from comedy action man to serious thespian, there's one role that Chan is always keen to play, cinematic guru. In his personal appearances, his fans are given a film lesson, the Jackie Chan way. You can see Gene Kelly, one shot for five minutes. Da, 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 up and down, up and down, up and down. Not like a, this day, everybody can be an MTV star. So easy, boom, boom, one cut, shoot, shoot, one cut, win, one cut, boom. Everybody can do it. I think Jackie Chan is a, is a tremendously inspirational figure. He's always trying to portray the very best qualities in a human being. Always be kind, always be generous, and always strive for the best. If I, if I was in his position as, as a major martial arts star, fingers crossed, touch wood, I would, I, I would definitely want to give back. I would definitely want to show other people the possibilities, get other people involved, inspire people to, to go out there and do it. On any Jackie Chan promotional tour, there's guaranteed to be at least one stop at the local Kung Fu school. Today, today Jackie Chan is going to come in and show you some weapon skills. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's really cool. It's brilliant to give something back and to inspire people. And I think that's what predominantly what he does is inspire. Bankable Hollywood action star he may be, but Jackie Chan's roots remain in Hong Kong. He's been happily married to a former actress for 20 years and jealously guards his privacy, running his own production company from a quiet back street of the city. She take care of my, this area. I think no matter where you're going, one day you have to back to your own hometown. I think that's my own hometown. On home turf, Chan continues to act and direct, passing on his filmmaking expertise to the next generation of Kung Fu kids. And staying loyal to the Hong Kong fan base who paved the way for his Hollywood success. I have a two kind of audience. I have my own audience who knows me for 20 years. They don't like I'm making American film. They don't like Rush Hour. They don't like uh, Shanghai Noon. The new audience, they like Shanghai Noon. They like Sh Rush Hour. They think that it's a great. On his Hollywood movies, Chan is learning to combine his old school stunt work with computer generated special effects, picking up a few trade secrets from a certain Oscar winning director. When I see Spielberg, I said, Spielberg, can you tell me how you make dinosaur, mountain, people walk together and jump together in the same shot. Here's Jackie, it's easy. I use a button, 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 that's all. Then he asked me, Jackie, how you jump from this building to this building? I said, oh, more easy. Rolling action jump. <laughs> Despite turning 50, there's no sign of Jackie Chan hanging up his Chinese fighting slippers just yet. So how does he rate in the list of all-time great Hollywood action heroes? He should be right at the top with uh, the guys like Stallone and, and Schwarzenegger, definitely. I have 
have no doubt that he'll be considered not just an action movie great, but also just a great a, a, a physical cinema. He's responsible, I think, for influencing a lot of the way modern martial arts is shot. People watch it and they really know he hurts himself. I always tell my people, life you never know. When you plan to do something, it never come true.